Hello and welcome to the Seren Stay at Home series archive. In this video, we welcome award-winning poet Kim Moore for a special Q&A session. We hope you enjoy watching it back. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Hello everyone. Can you hear me? Hello. Um, right, I'm Amy Wack from Seren Books and this is the Stay at Home series. And this is um, Kim Moore answering your questions about poetry. Um, Kim lives in Cumbria. She, her first collection was called The Art of Falling that appeared from Saren in 2015. Um, she also has a pamphlet from a prize winning pamphlet from the poetry business called If We Could Speak Like Wolves. Her um, poems from her first collection won the Jeffrey Dahmer Prize, Faber Memorial Prize. And also um, her pamphlet was uh, a winner in the poetry business competition. Um, she is a very popular and engaging poet. She also helps run the Kendall Poetry Festival. So it's very nice to have her here today. Kim, welcome. Come and answer some questions. We'll start out with one from our list of people who sent questions online. Um, the Art of Falling contains poems in many different forms from prose to couplets. How do you decide which poem, which form a poem will take and when in the writing process is a poem fixed on its final shape? Kim. Um, I always start off writing in my notebook in prose. So everything's just in prose. So I don't have to worry about the, the line breaks or anything. And then I kind of leave it in the notebook for a couple of weeks, sometimes months. Um, and then I type up onto the computer and that's when I start trying to work, work the form out. Usually that's the normal process. Um, and yeah, normally I can, I've, the, the lines that are working the best are telling me what shape the poem is going to be in. Um, there are some exceptions like the, there's a poem at the end of the sequence that's a sonnet and I knew that I had to write a sonnet to finish the sequence because I wanted a form that would kind of click close like a box that would kind of feel that the sequence was finished off and not kind of leaking into the rest of the the rest of the book. Um, the Sestina that's in the book, um, I started, um, I read a handbook about, a, not a handbook, uh, like a textbook about about poetry forms and I read that the Sistina is a really good form to use if you're obsessed with something and you can't stop thinking about it it's a really good form to use to explore that obsession so then I wrote a poem about um I started writing that poem sorry the screaming in the background is my baby <laughs> if you can hear that um yeah so I started writing the Sistina and I knew it was I picked the six words that would keep um coming back in the Sestino and just kind of went for it and it came out all in one pretty much all in one go um but it's re very rare that that happens it normally takes quite a while to kind of hammer the form out um yeah that follows I think um a related question about how your work has a great deal of momentum as though the reader is actually falling through the form itself um how do you achieve this momentum um Normally, not, not putting any full stops in. <laughs> um, but I think, it, I think it actually comes from being a twin and um, like long car journeys with my family. And I always remember talking really fast so that my sister couldn't jump in and like steal the attention. <laughs> that sounds awful, doesn't it? Because um, my mum and dad used to say, well, you give it a rest, take a breath. But we were both just like, rah, rah, rah. and I'm sure that comes out in, in the... Uh, in my poems as well um yeah so yeah i i like long run-on sentences that are kind of twisty and convoluted and um yeah so I, I think that's where it, i think that's there's where a big it comes sense from. of breath as well which might have might link into the running aspect of it as well there's a sense of uh, a journey and also uh propulsion can you yeah, talk about writing in your poems a little bit because i know you're a runner as well and i think that sort of helps inspire what you do as well um i've tried to write about i've tried to write about running but it just always fails yeah. um <laughs> yeah i i actually running is the only time my mind goes completely blank and i stop mm -hmm. thinking so I'm, I'm really jealous mm -hmm. of these poets that 
you know like Helen Mort says she goes for a run and she writes a poem while she's in her head while she's running and Ben Wilkinson has said the same thing to me and I'm like I just go blank and like, <laughs> um, I just run around like you know um yeah I could quite happily just run in silence I go I often run with people but I don't talk very often and just listen or just zone out so yeah but maybe the music has something to do with the kind of falling feeling through the poems that, that I play music um, yeah. okay um let's take a slightly different track here how important do you think it is for poets and publishers to have a good social media profile it seems almost essential these days um I suppose it depends what you want to do doesn't it it's um I don't think yeah, I think it's I think it's important for publishers to have a good social media profile and um and be active on social media <clears throat> and be kind of wise about it. Um thinking about the, some of the the um the worst thing is having a publisher that does terrible things on social media. <laughs> not not Seren, um but the the various things that have been that have been happening. Um but yeah, I'm not, I'm kind of torn with poets because some of the poets that I really love are not really on they're not on social media and I would still buy their books and um like Vicky Fever has just got a new book coming out this year and I don't think she's on any social media at all but it doesn't mean I'm you know I'm waiting for the book to come out because I love her work and I can't so I don't think you necessarily have to have to be on social media I don't think it necessarily sells more books or anything if a poet's on it I don't know Perhaps it's just to step in, step into a, your audience. Yeah, I think it's good. Like I, I, I use it to more for my teaching and stuff to to um kind of uh, get people on, you know, sell places on residential courses or on workshops. Um, yeah, I use it for that really more than. I it's think a way it's to get the news out. But do you like your? I think you're probably more of a Facebook person than a Twitter person. Some people prefer. Twitter. Um, I like Facebook because um, more my fam, all my family are on there. My my kind of non poetry friends are on there as well as poets. Um, Twitter feels a bit more anonymous to me, so I often put more political stuff on Twitter because a lot of my more right wing friends that are on Facebook aren't on there, so they won't. I won't get into a big argument with them. So I feel I actually feel a bit more free on Twitter. I can say what I what I want Excellent. it's on Facebook I'm worried about upsetting upsetting someone <laughs> that's true it's easy to spark a fight sometimes with people online yeah although that can happen myself. on Twitter can't it but yeah um right the pros and cons of having an underlying theme do you have any advice for um ordering poems in in a certain approach or um well I, yeah <laughs> I think this is really hard and I think this is where you need a, a good editor to kind of look over your shoulder as well. Um, I remember when I was putting the first collection together, I don't know if you remember this, Amy, I sent the sequence um, in one document and the collection as I thought of it in the other and you said, no, the sequence needs to go in the middle of the book. Um, and before that, I hadn't really thought of them together. I, I was thinking of the sequence as a pam little pamphlet and the book as something else. And then when when we did that that's when the book came together for me um and maybe i would have got there eventually on my own but it might have took it taken a couple of years i think of, of working it out but you just saw it straight away so i think that's why where an editor kind of looking that can stand back a little bit and and look for you is is a good idea um but the ordering i do the same as probably everyone else does i print them all out and lay them out on the floor and then despair <laughs> um but the, yeah, I can't remember what the, the question was now, but was it about ordering? About themes. Themes, yeah. I, I, I think some people are getting crossed with books with themes that hold them together, but I, I quite like them. And um, my, ne my next collection that I'm working on now is, has a theme running all the way through it. It's every poem's called All the Men I Never Married. Um, and they're all about all the men I never married. Uh, and I, it's great fun. I'm absolutely 
loving writing it and it makes it easy because I haven't got to think of the titles but I'm struggling with the order now like this moment I'm really struggling with it um I'm not like putting all the things on the floor now too really yeah well I'm not quite at that stage yet I'm still I'm still writing a few poems but I'm starting to try and the, like the center of your PhD as well right you've just done yeah. your PhD another question was is there a difference between between critical writing and creative writing and do you find that an easy um switch to make or um from the other when I when I started the PhD, to be honest, I got the I got the funding to do the PhD, and I was like, great, I've got funding to spend three years writing my poetry collection. And the the critical writing that I had to do was kind of on the. I thought it was like a thing I had to do so that I could write poetry, um, and I was kind of dreading it. And the first year, I really struggled. It was it was it was terrible. I I didn't enjoy. I was really stuck. I didn't know what to do. How am I going to tie the creative and the critical together? Blah, 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 blah. And every, my friends who had done it before kept saying this is part of the process um, that everybody goes through when you're doing a creative critical PhD. Um, and then I got uh, halfway through the second year and suddenly everything clicked into place and I started really loving the critical. And then the poems just started coming out of my critical reading as well as my reading poetry like I've always done. Um, and that when they when those two clicked together that was just amazing and it's been fantastic so it took me a year and a half I think I'm a bit of a slow burner but um yeah for me the creative it was actually when I read Sarah Ahmed's critical writing because she's a really I think she's a really poetic critical writer some of her prose is so beautiful and when I read her and I realized that you can write academic prose and still be poetic and lyrical and still kind of know your stuff that's when it all kind of clicked into place for me um and then the form of the phd i wanted to reflect that kind of struggle of the creative critical that um connection so it's yeah so the, the thesis is in the form of a choose your own adventure book so, um if anyone remembers choose your own adventure books from the 80s or 90s um when i was where you have the options at the end of so you're walking through a wood do you go into the house or do you go and kill the witch or whatever? Um, so my thesis is like that. So I've got like little groups of poems and then it says, would you like to read um, a, a bit of academic prose, which has a, a title or would you like to read another poem? And the reader kind of chooses their way um, through the text. So that's why the poetry collection isn't set out like a poetry collection yet. It's like in little clusters of, of poems, which is why I've not got to the order. <laughs> But I have got a thesis, so yeah. Yeah. So, um, I know you're a musician, but do other art forms um, influence your work? You just mentioned a, a creative critical writer. Um, um, other art forms. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a no, not really. I'm a bit. Of a, <laughs> I'm a bit of a philistine. I sometimes listen to music when I'm when I'm writing, um, but I'm kind of I have such little spare time now that I just if I, what the time I do have when I'm not looking after the baby, I just read, try and read poetry and try and keep up my, keep up my reading. Um, what are some of your favorite recent books? You mentioned a couple already. Um, Carolyn Forshay's oh. new book in the lateness of the world. That's just amazing. I think it's one of the best collections I've read. I've read this year. Um, Vicky Fever's new book. I want, I want, um, yeah, I've actually just finished reading for the Forward Prize. So I've been, I've read like 200 and something books in the last month and a half. That sounds um, challenging. Yeah, it, it kind of, I got most of them just before lockdown, but I was finishing my PhD thesis. Okay. And I finished that the day before lockdown, well, handed it in the day before lockdown and then started on the books. So whenever lockdown was, that's when I started reading the 250 odd books. Um, wow. Yeah, so it's been it's been good. It's kept me busy. I've quite enjoyed it actually because I've just used it as an excuse to skive off looking after the baby. I'm like, I've got to go and read these books. <laughs> um, so my husband, but my husband's been off work, so he's been looking after the baby, and I've just been sat here in my pajamas reading books. It's a terrible life. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds great though, actually. Wow. Right. Uh, can I ask you about your little Kendall Poetry Festival? Are you still planning? And uh, yeah, so 
so it was meant to be in june um and we we kind of postponed it um obviously for for obvious reasons so we kind of penciled in a date with the hotel in february um but i'm kind of losing hope that that's gonna go ahead with with everything that's happening and um, we've also just applied for some some of the emergency money to try and run a kind of small digital festival and we're going to do um we're going to do some readings from the poets that are going to appear at the the big festival and i also want to do a feature called lost books of the pandemic which um I kind of, i've stolen the idea from fiona sampson whose there book come down has come out um right in the middle of lockdown and she's doing little excerpts from it and she does hashtag lost book of the pandemic so i wrote to her and said could i steal the title for my for my arts council application and then um, would you come and do an event so i wanted to get kind of six poets whose books have come out during lockdown and kind of celebrate them and draw attention to them because i was just saying to sarah before we started i feel dead i feel really sorry particularly for the poets of first collections that have come out now because it's such a it's such a it can it's such a special time when your first book comes out and you can never get it back and yeah so i'd like to do something that will support the kind of publishers and poets but we haven't found out yet if we get the money or not so that's great well i've heard arts council england has been quite generous with people yeah they've, they've said that we can keep the funding until we run the festival again in february i don't know what will happen if we have to postpone again whether they'll just let us roll it over um yeah we'll have to see but um yeah i don't know <laughs> best of luck um i guess martin's just had a book out too haven't you martin crucifix have you got any questions, Martin, for um, Kim? Um, I'd, I'd like to hear what you had to say about kind of this question of identity. And, and the, it seems to me the poet um, is often um, expected even to write out of their own particular identity, um, which is, of course, interesting in itself. But whether that um, is that just a form of confessional uh, poetry, really? Mm, yeah, I think. Um, the first thing that kind of jumped into my head when you were when you were speaking um, was about this label of confessional poetry as well, which I think is is really interesting in itself um, because a lot of the poets I, I did a little bit of work in my PhD around um, Anne Sexton as a confessional poet and um, or the idea of yeah confessional poetry and lyric poetry and what we mean by lyric and confessional and how they cross over. And often um, those poets we think of as confessional are actually like, particularly Anne Sexton. She's she's a perform. Her confessionalism is performative. It's um, yeah, yeah. she's kind of performing a confessionalism, and she's very knowing, and she's got kind of one eye on the one eye on the audience, and it's a very um, artistic. It's a performance, not um, not uh, her personal expression yeah um and then things like i always remember reading a review of um don patterson's book rain which is one of my favorite poetry collections and um the reviewer said it was an a, a you know a brilliant exploration of masculinity um and uh but there was there's quite a few poems in there about his children whereas a woman's exploration of her children would just be all woman's writing about being a mother mm. but if a man does it it's an exploration of masculinity and the, you know so i kind of have a lot of um sympathy for the the kind of position of writing about identity i think men male poets have always written about identity and it's only become oh poets writing about identity when kind of minorities or right. women yeah. started writing about it um but I think it's also, I, I also, on the other side, can see how it can get exhausting to have to, to feel that you have to um, use your personal life in a poem. But um, yeah, I don't know if that, if that answers your question. So for, going back to my, my, um, my, own, my own work, the sequence in, the, in the, my first collection was definitely drawn from personal experience, but it's not... Um, from a personal experience of domestic violence, but it's not a narrative in any way. There isn't like a this happened and this happened and this happened. 
but it's it is extremely personal but i kind of put it through myth and um which nobody ever picked up on nobody ever picked up that there was loads of written, uh, references to ovid i was like i'm so clever i'm using i've read ovid this is amazing nobody ever noticed <laughs> um so and and like the all the men i never married i'm kind of playing around with um you know, when I do the introductions to the book, I say, oh, I'm, I'm writing this book, All the Men I Never Married. I'm on poem number 50. And I always get a laugh normally because people are find it surprising that a woman would admit to having 50 men they didn't marry. So I'm kind of playing around with those expectations. Um, but it's performative. It's not, it's not um, truth or confessionalism. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of playing the audience. Um, yeah 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 no absolutely i think that that performative aspect is is right and what you were saying about the lyric as well i've just been reading one or two things from louis mcneese and he he's got something about um you know even the lyric is is in fact a dramatic form and i think he means by dramatic that that kind of performative um quality um and um a couple of years ago, I was teaching Sylvia Plath, you know, and we talked about confessionalism and all this kind of stuff. But I mean, it's perfectly clear she is performing uh, as mm. much as, as, as Zan Sexton was and, and so on. Um, mm. So do you think the idea, you know, poets who write what would be thought of as, as sort of identity based poetry are also performative? Um, maybe performative, maybe performative is the wrong word because it sounds Performative, I think performative means they're artists. They take, and yeah. you said about your sequence, you, you take, obviously we write from personal experience, but, you know, it's what you do with it next. Isn't is it sort of like being a comedian? You have a voice, and the mm. voice isn't necessarily you, it's a persona, yeah. right? Yeah. You yeah. use in order to yeah. put your message across. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely. And I think... Um, I think every poem is about the self, isn't it? it? It has to be because it comes from a self. It comes from a body and the body is in the world in the way and is moving through the world in the way that it moves through the world. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think the confessionalism label kind of works, really. No. I don't think it exists. Um, I think it's a really hard thing to define, um, which you could argue the same about the about the lyric as well. Um, there's a great book called Lyric Shame by Gillian White, which you might have come across, and she talks about the um, the shame of the lyric poet and the shame of the personal, and then kind of deconstructs and says why um, the poets that we think of as performing this personal poetry are not really... Um, mm. About. It's not really a but yeah, it's a really good. She's the one that kind of got me onto Anne Sexton, and um, that's fab. Think of it, um, Darren Reese Jones, how she uses. I mean, she told me one time she used to, she's so involved in critical writing, she keeps like two computers open at the same time <laughs> for her critical writing and one of them for her lyric poetry. And her poetry is such pure lyric, but she's mm. really refined mm. it over the years into mm. that pure voice. How mm. she does it, it's like it's like a minor miracle. I don't know, yeah. the other side of her mind is like this intense critical mind. Mm. But then she pairs all that back, all the verbiage back into this like sort of pure emotional state. It's quite something. It's supposed mm. to suppress process of distillation more mm. than anything else. You can't say that it's not true, but it's a, mm. it's a distillation of qualities that makes it so powerful. Yeah, I think the, I think the poem has to have an emotional truth, not the actual yeah. truth. You so have to believe that it's somebody speaking, don't you? Think. Yeah, and like, like um, the all the men I never married. Some of the men uh, appear, like a few of the men appear, like five, six times in different poems. But I've made them out to be different ah. men, so the read, <laughs> so the reader will think that they're different men. Um, but I know that they're not. I know that there's they're, they're same, and it does the emotional truth. I hope, and the heart of the poem is there. The reader doesn't have to know that it's the same man that I'm kind of talking about because I'm not actually writing about a man, um, that man I'm writing about power and who has it and who doesn't um, um, I'm writing about the kind of between betweenness between people um, there's a great book that I really like about lyric poetry as well called Theory of the Lyric by Jonathan Culler 
Um, oh, yeah, and cool. he talks about um, that the lyric poem rarely addresses the audience directly. Um, it often we often use like um, he calls it triangulated address. So we often use an an other to talk to. So it'd be God or an unseen other, a lover, an animal, a bird, and we talk through that to the audience. Um, and the lyric rarely addresses the audience and so I was, I was thinking about about why that is and I think the poems so then I started trying to experiment with addressing the audience in my my work and um, the first time I did it in a poem I got heckled <laughs> by, this, by this old lady um, at a gig and <laughs> um, I was kind of doing a list of ex-boyfriends and then I get to this line that says are you surprised are you judging me yet and the the lady, this elderly lady shouted out, yes! And I thought, that's why you don't address the audience in a lyric poem. Um, because then you invite a response. We can't help it as human beings. When, we, when we're addressed, we have to, we have to say something yeah. or do something. Um, so, that, yeah, then I started just playing around with that and thinking, well, what can you do with, with address and, um, in, in lyric poetry? How can, we, how can you play around with that and um, make people feel a bit uncomfortable sometimes as well? Because I think poetry should make you feel uncomfortable sometimes. Uh, one more question. Sorry, go on. <laughs> Lockdown creativity. Oh, well, um, I, I'm one of the, you know, like, there was this article about um, male academics submitting more articles than before lockdown. I'm like a male academic. I'm terrible because my husband's been off work. So I've been, um, actually had more time because he's been able to take the baby. So um, I did Na Napo Rimo, you know, the National Poetry Writing Month, and I wrote a poem every day throughout April. First right. time I've kind of stuck stuck with it. Um, and my, some of them are a load of rubbish, but um, I really enjoyed it. And it kind of got me back into prioritizing my my poetry instead of prioritizing freelance work and admin and um yeah so I, i've absolutely loved it but i have fell off the wagon a bit since the end of april um and haven't written quite as much but yeah so lockdown's been pretty good for me i'm one of those annoying people that have managed to do something productive to an, and it's all the reading as well like we re, i have to read poetry to write it so all the reading for the forward has just made me write lots as well um I've also had like the normal kind of mental breakdowns that everyone else is having during lockdown. <laughs> I know when it first started happening, like the poet Paul Henry, uh, I was talking to him. And I was like, oh, no, there's going to be a lot of bad lockdown poems now. And he's like, it'll be worth it if there are two or three good ones. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I think it's great. I think you have to write a, like you have to write about it and everything I read is like colored by it's like looking if lockdown was like a stained glass mirror it's just affecting everything everything that I read as well and um yeah I think you have to write I think you have to write about it um and if you tell yourself not to write lockdown poetry you'll just end up doing it anyway and you have to do it it has to be done yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I've got I've got a friend David Tate who's a poet who's in China who went through it all you oh, know wow. kind of That's months early. before us and um He's wrote some amazing, amazing lockdown poems, which are, yeah, kind of shocking and awful and brilliant. So, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Kim Moore, for your lively answers and the great discussion from other people. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, everyone else. It's been wonderful to have you. Hope you can come along to some other Saren Stay at Home events. And, um, Kim, we will look forward to reading all the new poems and seeing what happens with the forward prices.